My name is Sumit Amar and I work at Visa and I lead a product architecture team. And um, I'm here to talk about some API design and usability. And um, quick disclaimer, I'm going to be talking about uh, my own opinions, not my company's opinions, so just uh, to get that out of the way. Um, quick agenda for this session today is that we're going to talk about um, the RESTful principles, representational state transfer. Um, not anything added to that, you know, it's going to be based on uh, Roy Fielding's work of 2000. Um, but we're also going to talk about uh, hate OS. What that is, is um, hypertext as the engine of application state. In other words, it's basically adding some help inside the API responses. Instead of, um, you know, having the developer figure out how they got to that response, we're going to put some links and help so that they can understand how to replicate that result set. Um, we'll talk more about that in detail with some examples. We also want to talk about old data, open data framework um, that gives us ability to retrieve data via an API in a very simple SQL-like manner. I'll show you some examples of that and also we'll give you some, uh, um, some background on how it came about. And, and also, how do we modify entities? How do we manipulate entities uh, that are representing some domain model on our application and how they are represented in the URLs or in your API signatures? Um, finally, we're going to discuss the webhooks or the callbacks uh, for two different cases. One, for the long-running operations. The second is for just trying to listen in on all the changes that are happening for a particular entity and its events. Um, so let's talk about the first topic first. Um, which is about the RESTful uh, uh, syntax. So, you know, we want to make sure that we want to depict our entities uh, in the URL form, but we also want to depict them in a way that it's easy to understand. And they also have to be nouns. They have to be things, uh, not some sort of operations in the URLs. Um, and, you know, we also want to talk about the HTTP verb usage, how the different uh, HTTP methods are used against the entities that you're creating so that it looks like an English sentence when you're trying to retrieve something or trying to modify something. Um, we'll glance over how the entity relationships can be depicted in the URL itself, as well as in the body of a URL's uh, response. Um, we'll glance over some status codes and talk about item potency as well a little bit. So let's talk about this first uh, topic. It's very simple. This talk is going to be 200 level, very easy on the uh, on the eyes. It's not going to be uh, uh, you know any complications, uh, complicated topics in it. Well, let's start with the easy stuff first. You know, we want to have entities as the nouns, and also want to have pluralize them. And you know, somebody asked me, why do you pluralize the entity name? Why not just user? And you, that's also some of the companies uh, have done in the in their public APIs. And then, you know, my response is generally that, you know, when you have a, when you call something an entity, where did that come from? The concept came from how we stored data in the beginning in a database and in, in a table. And you don't create tables to record just one uh, item in it, right? You just, you can have one record in a table, but you could have uh, more records also, right? So you generally would have more records. That's why pluralization makes, makes more sense in my opinion. And also, the, the next topic is important. Why it's pluralized? Because we want to represent the entity in the form of an instance of an entity as well as a collection of the entity. Either we are retrieving number of records, which are more than one, or we're trying to just work on one record at a time. And the one record we talk about is an instance. And you can see in this example, we have um, a user's collection that has one A as an identifier. That means we're trying to get one instance of this particular user's entity. Very simply, the uh, the issue methods that you already know about, get, post, put, delete. Uh, put, you know, naming is a little bit off. You know, it's very uh, uh, funny the way that the, the names are given, actually. But uh, the thing about put is that you modify an entity, but you have to send the whole entity. What that means is that if I'm modifying an entity which has, uh, let's say, seven fields, I want to modify only one field, I have to send all seven at, at the same time. Um, but there's a benefit of that, too. That means if I make this API call over and over again, what will happen? I will not create new records. I'll just keep updating the same record. If I have intelligent code in the back end, I'll just uh, ignore that uh, repeated uh, same records that is coming in. But I also want to optimize that a little bit and not have to send the whole entity every time. So that's where the patch uh, HTTP method comes into picture. Who has used patch? I'm curious uh, to see uh, here. That's great. Like four people have used patch out of maybe 20, um, which is good, actually. But you know, when you have used patch, you also might have run into a problem with patch. 
give you an example. You use patch, you use patch, and you have three attributes in this entity that you can modify, name, age, and say game, okay, that you play, game ID. Um, and you change the name of the person. You just said, okay, patch slash user slash ID of this user one A, change the, the name. And you think the name has been modified, other things have been left alone. But at the same time, the other person also modified another attribute, but you never knew about that. So should both of your entity be successfully updated or will there be some lost update problem? It could be, it could cause a lost update problem because you wouldn't know that the, modif the modification of the entity was already uh, in progress. So the concurrency causes some problems with the patch. So you have to handle that specifically. Two, two methods to handle that. Uh, if you come from the database background, you might actually add in the entity last modified date time and also the created date time. So when the, when the first person modifies, you change the last modified date. Second person comes in, when they made the call, their date time has to be updated, otherwise you will reject that uh, API call. That's one method. The newer method, however, is to use e-tags. Have you guys used e-tags? So e-tags allow you to provide a number from the server side and whenever you modify anything, you have to send the e-tag and you have to say if match this e-tag number. Um, so that means if another person has modified it, that means the e-tag that you're sending is not gonna be valid. So then you're gonna be returned 412 error code back to the, to the user. So that's the only caveat I will say when you implement patch, very useful thing, but just handle the last update problem, otherwise you'll run into issues and then you'll realize when the scale on your API increases in the future. The other thing is that, you know, I. Um, want the developer uh, to, to understand what methods are available on this entity. I have a user's entity, but can this person who's invoking the API, can they um, retrieve the details of the user? Can they modify it? Can they delete it? How can they know all the API methods, uh, HTTP methods that are implemented on this entity? So when they make an options call, you can return all the methods that are valid. Uh, if you want to go overboard on this, you also can check the authorization of this user and then return only the ones they have access to so that they don't have to find the hard way that they don't have access to a particular method. Entity relationships, let's talk about this very simple uh, player here that we are trying to create. Um, three different fields and when we create it, you can note that the status code is 201, it's not 200 only. Um, 201 means created, that means entity was successfully created. And there are two approaches. Sometimes you will see that 201 created will return the entity body to you. Sometimes it'll just not return. It'll just be okay, hey, successfully created. Um, but you should, should not return 200. So you have to return the status code based on what you're really doing. But now let's take a look at more stuff about the entity relationship. That this player 1A is a player, but then they, when they play video games, they also win some trophies. Um, and let's say the trophy is uh, Mario Champion, okay? Game and trophy name, two attributes are given. Um, the entity was created. Now to, and maybe let's say we created more trophies for this, uh, this uh, player. When you see the result back, when you say get player slash one A, so I'm trying to get an instance of this player back, and you can see that I have the trophies as a collection, and the bodies of these trophies are also returned. So that means I have a navigational property from, um, this player to what trophies they have. But there are many things missing in this body and we are gonna talk about that in the, in, in the next slides. Quick, uh, you obviously cannot read all of these. Maybe you can. <laughs> um, but a real quick thing I wanna mention in this slide is that uh, there's a pattern here that all the things that start with 200, they are basically good things. Different good things, but things are good, okay? <laughs> and anything that is 300, Things are okay, but the things have, might have moved or things might appear to you, but they may be implemented in a different way. For example, you're trying to retrieve a resource, but that had probably the URL has moved somewhere, but you still get the result back. You got three or four, that means a cache hit happened. You got the result, but it may not be from the server side that we returned. All the 400 stuff is actually the user error. You could argue that in some cases, like 429, for example, too many requests were sent, so throttling response was sent back. You know, maybe the API user knew that they were they're trying to bombard the trying to DDoS you, but sometimes they may not know exactly what happened. A conflicting uh, entity was updated. Two users tried to update. They didn't know that they were intentionally making an error, but they actually did make a user error because somebody else also modified the same entity, uh, or tried to at least. Now all the 500 things are the server errors or the the things that you have to be really careful about. And the 500 errors, 500 internal server error 
If your API is returning that, you got to address that. <laughs> um, I generally joke with my developers that, you know, when you return a 500 internal server error to somebody who's using your API, you're basically um, saying something very mean to them, uh, okay? Um, <laughs> you know, it's actually, generally it happens when you did not handle the crash, you didn't handle the exception, program crashed, and you returned 500 internal server error. But this is something that you must avoid. This is the worst error. And you, you will see that the newer developers generally would have that. And as they become experienced, then the, the 500 internal server, uh, you know, goes down a little bit. But it doesn't mean that you wrap it and just return 200 OK. I have also seen that. Somebody catches the exception, 200 OK is returned, and then the body of the response contains some error message. But that's definitely a big no-no. Um, talking about item potency, you know, I talked about this a little bit already, that you, when you modify a resource again and again, the resources don't get created. Resource means entity. I interchangeably use this term. Um, you just basically have to um, manage the patch special case, which I just talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but this is the fun stuff. Let's talk about hey to us. Um, you know, I, I have an example where I uh, made an API call. I gave some response body to my uh, UX diviner, design uh, dev kind of hybrid diviner. And they tried to use that static data and then try to bind some data into the UI. Um, but the diviner we have is smart. They want to make some changes to the data. They want to make another API call to get some new data. But they don't know how they got the data in the first place. So when I showed you the earlier example of player, they cannot replicate that. Because they can type it, obviously, but they cannot hit an API and find out another player's details, right? So we want to give some help to those guys. When they see the response, they should be able to get more information out of that. Um, sometimes, you know, they got three uh, attributes returned, but the actual entity had 10 attributes. How do they know that there are seven more attributes? So we're gonna take a look at how to implement that. So see that this part over here, you already saw that we had the ID name, country code, and game ID, which we created earlier. Now if you take a look at here, there are two entities actually. If you some return somebody just the data section, they wouldn't know what entity this is. They wouldn't know that it is players, unless they actually know that they made the call to get to players. So the first link, is about href of how to get here. How to get this data is player slash 1a. You make the simple API call, you'll get this result. Now, if you wanna see whatever is not returned or maybe they're part of the schema, then you can say schemas dollar players. And some frameworks generate that automatically. Sometimes they will have add the rate sign. In, in, I, I saw that in OData implementation of .NET had add the rate sign, but in Java that was using, uh, Olingo was using dollar uh, sign. So th really, this is just to distinguish that it is not an actual entity invocation. You're just trying to get the schema details back. So you're distinguishing that from the actual entity. But then also, REL is a relationship. The data that you've just received, what's the relationship of that with this entity that you're showing in this link? Either it is self, that means you made a call to players, so that's just player data, or it is spelled out as players. But also, the, the diviner who got this data, they want to understand what is this game ID and how can they get more details about this game. Um, so we also have a solution for that. So we'll say game slash 1G will get you to the game. So this is basically a hyperlink within the API. It's kind of like clicking a hyperlink inside a document and going there. So now this uh, developer or, or designer will actually be able to navigate to that by like, taking a look at this URL. Also, they can find out more information about the games by looking at the schema, and the REL just means that this is the relationship between player and the game's entity, okay? I wanna talk about open data framework a little bit because this session is about um, having consistent and predictable APIs, okay? My frustration generally when I'm coding against an API is, is the, the disparity between the different endpoints. I understand an API how to retrieve the data. I have a from date, end date, and I filtering something, but I go to another entity, I don't know, they may not implement that, okay? And I don't know how the page, I have to go to the documentation to understand that. But you know, every single you know, second or minute you're using of a developer's time, they're gonna start you know, uh, hating us a little bit, right? Because uh, developers have one thing in common, they're opinionated. They're definitely gonna express their opinion <laughs> when they don't like something, I do. Um, so definitely I want something simpler to understand. 
again, you know, replace the developer with uh, somebody who is just a normal user of a UI system. We spend a lot of time, energy, money on doing usability studies of user interfaces. Okay, we do that. Right? In the majority of the companies, we you know, bring these users, put them in a glass box, we observe them, what they're doing, we give them some task lists, and they try to figure out the system, right? And I remember when I worked at Microsoft for about 10 years, about nine years I worked there, and I used to go to the usability studies of SDKs and APIs. So the company, I have some respect for that they did pay attention to doing usability study of the code as well, not just of the user interfaces of the products, uh, UIs, okay? So, now, similarly, what, what I'm talking about here is that I want to make sure that the person who is trying to understand and use your APIs should be able to uh, predictably use that system. And how can that happen? Um, by reducing cognitive dissonance, I just mean that, you know, don't overload the developers in having them to think about how this will work. Just give them a predictable way of using the system so they can retrieve uh, data, they can filter data, they can select or project and uh, or sort, as well as get counts, et cetera. So these are the things that you want to talk about in this O data framework. Um, and to implement O data framework, the uh, their library is already existing. Olingo is an Apache thing uh, for Java, and then there is uh, ASP.NET already has had um, uh, the uh, support for O data built in. Uh, maybe about ten years ago, I went to a conference to speak called the um, Microsoft Tech Ready. I think it used it used to be called Tech Ready. Now it's called Microsoft Ready. And I heard a session on something called Sitka framework. And lots of Microsoft products code name used to be on, based on some mountains or some you know, scenic uh, places. And I think Sitka is some place like that, I'm not sure. But what I noticed was the main message in that session was that you can create URLs that look like database queries. And I was very impressed. But then I don't know what happened after a few years. But later I realized that Microsoft and SAP worked together to create this uh, OData framework. And and it could have been created by any other company, not saying that just because I worked there and you know this is a, yeah, it's just a coincidence really. Um, I haven't worked there for many years now already. So now let's take a look at the attributes that we want to use in the URLs and what are the equivalent of those in uh, NCI SQL. So I try to mention the, um, the in the parenthesis how it looks like in the database query and how it looks like in the O data query. Select, basically we're trying to just find the fields that we're interested in. Filter is just like a where clause. You're trying to shorten the result set that you're getting. But this is more than just SQL query. We're trying to not only get a simple equality like, we also want to run some more complex functions in there. Uh, top is very similar to you know limiting the result set, the number of results that you get. And offset is basically what record number you want to start at, basically index. So when you look at top and offset, it clearly tells you quickly that it is useful for paging scenarios in the APIs. That means developers don't have to get all the results set, stream the results set, have another thread running, takes data, you know, modifies it, and then you know, tries to do another paging system on top of that. You don't have to do that when you can do this in the API itself. And also because these are in the URLs, you also can implement a smart caching technique that if the data doesn't change, you don't have to actually look up every time. I also want to talk about expand. Um, Let's say you have a, a player and then a game. I'm going to use a simple example I've been giving earlier. And you have um, um, a game ID given for the result for this player. But what you generally do is you make another API call to find out what this game is. Okay? But what if you could expand the game object right in line within the player's object? So that's where the expand comes into picture. Any aggregation entities you have, like player could have an account and player could have a game or a trophy, you can expand all of them or some of them depending on your need. So that means you don't have to make another API call, but rather you can just expand the result set right in place. And we're gonna take a look at an example of that too. And count is very simple, just get the list of a number of records instead of returning the records. So instead of returning 10,000 records and saying, okay, show me count of those, or getting array variables count, you just say count and then you, it will not return you anything, it just give you the count number. So let's take a look at this and here also the HateOS links will make more sense. When I want to get players and you can see the syntax is really simple, select is equal to name. I just want to get the name and its value and you can see that I can replicate this now. If I gave this data to the, uh, the developer to work with who's not the core developer on my team, they can just replicate that and they can change it and get other d details as well. Okay. Now let's take a look at another example where they want to filter something and they also want to select something. 
select ID and name, so they want only two fields. They also want to filter whenever the name is equal to A and B. Okay, so that's what you got. And also you can see that in this uh, headers link, they have ability to replicate that. This example is showing a paging scenario, top one offset two. So start at the second record and get only one record. So this is how you can build your paging solution in, in the API. Expanding, this is the example I was show, talking about earlier that you have this player data. You can see that player one expand game is given. So that means game who is a, an aggregated entity part of players or relationship is established, then you're able to retrieve the detail of that right in place itself. So without making an extra call, you'll be able to get the detail right there. Because also um, the games entities involved, you also have the detail about navigating to the game if you want to. But there is something I wanted to show you quickly here. If you notice this uh, carefully, you could argue that, hey, look, you know, so you did not return the game attribute here at all but you still gave the game's AWS link. Is it useful? No, it's not, it's a bug. So I shouldn't have <laughs> returned that. Um, okay, so order by is very sim simple. That is just returning the sorted list of data. And you also can use name and then say DESC for descending order, very similar to SQL query. Um, and this way also you don't have to do any of the uh, funky stuff in your code base. You can just do that at the API level itself. Now there is a use case that I wanna to talk to you about. Um, some people tell me, hey, you know what, Sumit, whenever you um, want to get simple API calls, you can retrieve stuff and modify stuff, what if I wanna run a function on something? What will happen then if I wanna run a method on a collection or a part of the collection and then return some data that matches it? So let's go back to the lambda expression first, based on lambda calculus. This players, this is in C sharp, and Java syntax is very similar. So instead of you know equal to sign and greater than, it'll be dash greater than. If you write Java, you'll know. So let's say players is a is a collection, okay? And any means it's very similar to database query of any that I want to get all the players where P is basically this predicate means P is the one instance of players. So that's me that means it's a one player. Wherever this player's address, the city is foster city, and this player has a valid trophy. I want to return that, okay? And it, this validate trophies method, just assume that it is not a simple method which is just checking a status variable. It may be some more computation, inference, or something that you have to call a method for. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to invoke a method which may be an extension method on the sanity players, but you're trying to also check that the, this player lives in Fossity, and only then I want to return this player. Now, you have to return this in a URL. You have to implement this in a URL. How would you do that? This is where you know a lot of people go into the API signature and say, hey, get blah and validate blah. I mean, that's, that's not needed, I think. Of course, you know when you first look at this syntax, it might look very ugly, very clunky, but it has a structure to it, okay? So let's review that. I'm trying to get players. I want to get a filter expression on it because I want to filter the result set based on no, not only that the player lives in Fossity, but also when they have a certain criteria met using this method. So very similar to the C-sharp syntax, I got players slash any, instead of a dot, I, could, I use slash in this case. P colon, very similar concept, P is, you know, the instance member predicate is represented as colon instead of greater than equal, uh, equal to and greater than sign. P slash address slash city, kind of navigational property is equal to foster city, and P dot validated trophies. Obviously in the server side, when you represent this class in a, uh, in Java it's called CSDL or in C, C sharp normal class, you would have to implement this extension method or member method, you know, if you like to uh, mix and match your uh, uh, data and then the operations. Generally, I try to keep them separate. The data contracts just has a class body and the method will be separate. But when you want to show it like they're part of the class, you can create an extension method. But anyways, so this has to exist in your definition. But now when you run this, you get the same result as what was shown in the high level language. Okay. Very useful. I mean, uh, I want you to uh, think about this. This was one example, but then you can implement that in many different ways uh, and, and extend your signature. So you can see the signature remains restful. You're just still looking at the player's collection, but then the other things are just to filter in a more complicated way, in a 
in my opinion, that is a clean way because if you know lambda expressions, then it will look very simple. Manipulating entities, I've talked about this earlier already, that put is for manipulating or modifying the whole entity. It's by default idempotent uh, method. Patch is not by default idempotent. To implement an idempotency, you will have to use the uh, e tags or a uh, modified date uh, time to manually check for, for that. Now, bulk operations. You know, what, what are bulk operations? Bulk operations could mean two things. One is that I'm sending large number of records, large amount of data, uploading them. That itself will take a long time. But that also could mean that I'm sending relative amount of data, but my processing is taking a long time. So that means, you know, the, the problem with the HTTP-based uh, protocol is that it's stateless. That means, you know, you don't have a connection maintained. Obviously, it works on top of TCP, but you make a request, you basically, if you don't get back right away the response, then you're gonna get hanging. So what do you do in that case? You have to then in that case return a 202 status code that, hey, look, you know, your request is accepted. I got it, I got this. Here is your number that you can pull. Because, you know, we're not always connected, so we don't, we're not always able to just say, hey, look, this is the update for you. But polling is also a bad thing in a stateless because you're creating a full turn. Turn is a technical term used for making requests and receiving the response back in HTTP. And that's expensive because every time you do that, you send all the headers, you receive the headers, you process the, so it's a very, very expensive thing. So what then should we do? In majority of the cases, we're gonna say, look, you know, give me your URL that I need to invoke. When I'm ready, I'll let you know. Don't ask me, are you there yet? Are you there yet? No, that's not needed. Just I'll, I'll let you know when I'm ready. And let's take a look at that, how to implement this too. Now, we don't want to implement web hooks just in case of long running operations. We want to implement them in general. I'll give you examples. This player wants to know that whenever my friends win a new trophy, I want to be notified. Whenever my trophy expires, I want to be notified. Okay, or whatever else, right? All the entity and the event on that entity that happens, I want to be able to subscribe to that. And, and that's why the model that you should create is entity, which is this case player, created is an event. Player gets created for this user. This user ID is actually the, uh, the API user ID, not the, uh, the actual player's ID. But you can make, it that, make that optional also. And because sometimes when you create a web hook, you could make it very chatty. Like all the people that I have as friends, I have 100,000 friends, somebody is winning trophy every second. I don't want to be notified, so I can deactivate that web hook as well. I should be able to do that. Then callback, this is the interesting part, that as an API developer, uh, API user, I said, you know what, I want to listen to all the players that are created. But whenever they are created, you invoke this URL. This is my URL, please invoke it, okay? Um, but when I give this URL to other people like this, anybody can try to DDoS it and invoke it, right? And it could create lots of traffic on me and I don't want to do that. Um, and also I don't want it to be intercepted by anybody because it, it, this case player created, but I, what if it was some card created or issued or you know payment made or something in, in a secure way? So I want to do a symmetric key which is um, a shared secret method of you know securing the channel. That means I give the key portion to another uh, party, they encrypt it, and I have another portion of that to decrypt it. So this is to secure the channel. I'm saying, look, you know what? Um, use this key to uh, encrypt my data. You could still be on HTTPS. Actually, in fact, I should have had HTTPS here. Um, that means my channel is already secure, but I also want the data message level encryption to happen by using this key. Now. Even if it is secure, um, you know, what, what if other people can just send me junk data and invoke my API? I also want to ex control the access of who can make API calls on, on my uh, callback URL. So I'll say, you know what, there is a user and password, base64 encoded, please use, you know, basic authentication and jam this access token when you're making calls to me. So I'm really dictating the API system to construct an API call to send me a callback so that it's secure and it is uh, um, valid and also it is uh, um, authenticated. But also because my system, I'm still developing it using a new system, I'm building a new product. Sometimes I might be down or I'm testing in, uh, you know, in my lower environments. It's not like I'm gonna say, okay, you know what, I don't debug my code, but when I do, I do it in production. It's not like that, right? Because in this case, I'm not gonna give production API access directly to the guy when I'm still developing it. So I might give the lower level environment, which may be sometimes down. So I want to tell the system, please retry at least up to five times or n number of times. That's why the retries uh, thing has been given. 
So with this webhook model, you um, make your APIs automatically much more use usable than, than earlier. Because nobody has to poll on your APIs. When they poll, they're unnecessary polling also, which means that traffic is, is, is uh, you know, much more than it should be on your APIs. And also the people that are calling them, they have to pay as well if you're doing metering. In summary, you know, uh, we talked quickly about the RESTful syntax, and I know about at time, I think. Um, OData for predictable way of retrieving stuff, using appropriate error codes, obviously, and error messages as well. Another thing I didn't mention here in the slide, but I want to mention to you is that when you return somebody a 400 bad request, have you ever returned that status code, bad request to the user who tried to create something? When you do that, you have to tell them what is bad about it, okay? <laughs> You have to tell them that, wait, you know, you did not enter uh, six letters length of, uh, you know, this pin code of India's or, or you did not, mm, you know, use alphabets on uh, the name or you use uh, alphanumerics in the phone number, etc. So you have to tell them, like, exactly what went wrong. More uh, documentation you can embed inside your API error messages or the haters links, the better. Of course, you may have very good, nice documentation as well but API usability makes all the difference. Take a look at Stripe, for example. It's like, it's not like they invented the uh, payment gateways, right? Or did they? <laughs> the payment gateways have existed for more than 20 years. And Stripe just came over very recently, and they have one of the best APIs out there. Usable and a very nice developer portal, easy to play around with and build solutions, and also very, very uh, predictable API. So it makes all the difference. So you could increase the economies of your business if you have good APIs. I think that's uh, kind of my message as well. Um, that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. And thank you for sticking around till the end of the... <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't know GraphQL. Maybe I should look at <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know GraphQL. I haven't uh, looked at it, uh, but I will go back and take a look. I've heard about it. I haven't seen what, what the capabilities are. But OData uh, is mentioned odata.org. It's version 4 is the latest one. It's been there in version 4 for a couple of years already. Um, but I'm going to take a look at the GraphQL too. Is the option to return it as a as well? No. The options will just tell you what each methods are available on an entity. Like get, post, put, but not delete. Oh, sorry, I should have reminded you. <laughs> yeah, you can read. So I'll repeat the question. First question was, what's the difference between GraphQL and OData? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the other question is, uh, does the options also return whether webhooks are enabled on an entity? No, it doesn't. What else can I tell you? Well then, thank you, and I appreciate it. Enjoy your evening, and thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate that big time.